thank you all for joining us this evening. You've reached the six perfections. Um, some of us are in person in the Gompa. Welcome to all of you as well. And of course, all of you here on Zoom. Um, this is the six perfections, practice of the Bodhisattvas led by Venerable Yunten. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. So uh, welcome everybody. Some of you have been coming each week and some of you are popping in and out. So all of these things are really easy to understand, even if you've missed classes and it's easy to kind of go back and read through if you're curious. But what we'll do each time is start with a prayer to set our motivation. So if you're in person and you want to look at a book text rather than a screen text, um, it starts on page 91 of what says Lama Chippa in front of you. So on page 91 is our motivation prayer. And so just thinking for a moment to connect with your spiritual refuge. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings, enacting virtuous deeds, and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratamoksha, Bodhisattva, and Tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagajuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. Sange churum sugi churam lai janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupa sho sange churum sugi churam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki Rola penche sange drupa sho. Sange churum so ki chunam la. Janchu padu dane kapsu chi. La ki chun yan ki pe sonam ki. Rola penche sange drupa sho. And so just letting that motivation sink in. That the reason we do this study is in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And in particular, may we increase our practice of generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom. Okay, 
So you can relax your attention. And um, last week we did generosity in depth. So before we go on, I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts about generosity that you wanted to share now that it's had a week to brew. Um, we talked about things like the fact that generosity is not just giving stuff, that generosity could be offering a safe space, like offering freedom from fear, that generosity is also things like loving kindness and compassion, that generosity could be offering timely advice or dharma, and it could be offering material aid. But that's not the main thing when we talk about generosity. We're talking about a mental intention that's ready to give. So when we were talking about that, or even as you're listening to it right now, do you have any thoughts or stuck points or additions or anything that came up? Yeah, Joanne. Doesn't it take incredible skill to know when to offer Dharma to somebody else? I think that's safely beyond me at this stage. <laughs> the Gompa is laughing with you. Um, <laughs> um, it's, do you know what my rule of thumb is if they ask, right? Like, when do you offer Dharma or when do you offer advice of any kind? When they ask, right? If they're not asking, they're not open to it. Yeah. Now they might not be asking in words and that's where it does get more of like a special skill, I think, is to hear when are they asking, but not in words. When does someone really look like they're struggling? They're having a rough time. They could really use some support. And when are they kind of like just needing to vent their problem and talk about the fact that things are rough, but they don't need you to solve it. They don't need you to tell them anything. They just want you to hear them. Yeah. And so you kind of bring your own experience to when am I open to hearing someone else's feedback? <laughs> like, what are the conditions necessary for me to care what anyone has to say? Yeah, especially if it's in the realm of advice or spiritual guidance of some kind. You know, when do you hear it? So that's the first question to ask. Like, what are the internal conditions and the external conditions? Mm -hmm. Is it the source? You know, there's someone that you're always in the mood to hear timely advice from and someone that they might have perfect advice, but you don't want to hear it from them because they have some sort of weird agenda or they're patronizing or condescending. You know, they're rude about it or they think you're better than you or they have pity. So it's like the words are good and fine, but it's like creepy and cringy and you don't want to listen, even if the words themselves are good things that you agree with. You know, and this, this is where we kind of look at is someone else doing spiritual bypassing? You know, we do our own spiritual bypassing when we try to radically reframe our troubles before we actually feel the pain of them. You know, so something, someone was just really unkind to you. They criticized you or they said something really awful and you immediately go to, oh, but they must have been having a bad day or, oh, think of their historical context or oh, think of their socioeconomic status and their history of oppression. Oh, think about, you know, it's hot today, their blood sugar's low. And you go into a whole story of justifying why they treated you badly, which is a wonderful thing to do, but not yet. <laughs> the first step is, Oh, that hurt, ouch, 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 right? So the spiritual bypass would be to try and jump over the step of acknowledging that that really hurt. Yeah, and that that was a really unkind thing to say. And of course, everyone makes sense given their context. Of course, we wanna give people the benefit of the doubt, but we're allowed to acknowledge our own pain. In fact, we need to, or we'll never move through it into anything else. So if you know what spiritual bypassing looks like for you, then you can see it in other people, I think really easily, when they actually don't have the space to hear your struggle, they're sending you to a solution because they want to get you away from them, <laughs> or they're sending you on a solution because you're more fun when you're happy. Yeah, so they're like, I'll try and do something to make you happy, not because I want you to feel better about this problem, but because it's awful to be with a depressed person, let me fix you for my sake. You know, so if you can see it within yourself, you can see it in others. And then you ask yourself back to yourself, when am I the one doing that? Offering the radical reframe, offering the way of looking at a broader perspective that is actually jumping over 
this moment's pain. So it's kind of like you start with yourself, then you look at how that goes with others, and then you come back to yourself. And if you know you're genuinely offering from a place of assuming some openness, and you genuinely don't need to fix them, you're just offering an invitation, then the giving of Dharma, I think. Mm, thank you. Yeah. So, you know, knowing you, I think you could offer Dharma sometimes. <laughs> knowing you. <laughs> sometimes. sometimes. When thank you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Tenzin, did you want to add something? Hello. Um, I just got a question uh, um, about generosity. Um, I feel like to be generous, we have to be in a, you know, be in a position to be able to give, right? Um, so, and, and on that note, I was thinking, um, you know, what about the times when uh, we are not in a position to be able to give, or we're not in a position where we think that we're giving enough? Do you know what I mean? Like, want to give more, but then we were, you know, A, not in a position to give more, or B, maybe even holding back a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so what would you, um, what would you say about that, that kind of a scenario? Like, like, how do you gauge how much you actually can give? Yeah. How do and you, like, you know how what, much and when? Yeah, like, uh, it, you know, in simple words, how much is enough? In very simple words. Yeah. You know, because sometimes, you know, you feel bad uh, that you can't give more. So w when you feel bad that you can't give more, is it, is it, am I attached or am I clinging to giving more? Am I being attached to generosity? Right. Or, I mean, I think or, only you know. <laughs> I mean, only you know the answer to that. You and the Buddhas, right? But yeah. I think that there's a really good point that you're touching in on. And there's a few pieces, like one is the piece of, we want to identify as a good person, right? Like it makes us feel good to be a good person and a good person is nice to people and does stuff for them. So what if we're tired or grumpy and we just don't have it in us that day, then our identity cringes and says, how can I identify as a good person if today I just want to stay home and like watch YouTube videos, right? And like pet the cat and I don't know, have snacks. You know, <laughs> like, what, how, can I say I'm a good person if that's my plan for the day? You know, and then you have this like internal cringe and then you reframe and say, no, no, it's self-care. It's self-care. I can do self-care, self-care for the greater good, you know, and then secretly, you know, but I actually could mow the lawn, but I'm just not going to, you know, and you have this whole kind of dance in your mind of justification and it just gets tangled and yucky and like, never mind that. Generosity is the intention to give. It's not the giving. The behaviors of giving are a wonderful bonus that we aspire to. But in your heart, if you can think, when I can, I will. It makes a little bit of an internal mirror where you notice that there are times that you could and you don't, and there's times that you do, but you shouldn't. Yeah, because you're tapped out that day. You know, so if you're holding, the main practice is having a continuous intention that's both looking for openings to be of service in some way, to be a good friend, to be whatever, but also is not pushing for the sake of like stroking your ego, saying, I'm such a good person, I'm such a good friend. You know, it's just this quiet internal mirror that is asking, what are my reasons for doing? Because generosity isn't doing. It's intending from a Buddhist perspective, which totally takes the pressure off of how much and what does it look like and what's too much and what's not enough. Don't, mi don't mind that, that's not even the point. Yeah, the point is, am I ready to? You know, if you're not in a generous mood and your best friend calls you on the phone, you'll be like, eh. yeah, not picking that up. Even your best friend, who you love, who you normally would totally have space and time for, if your heart is shut down, you're just going to be like, ugh, you know? But if you're in a generous space and your phone rings and you don't have time, then you go, oh, I'm going to come back to that. You still might not answer, right? But it's from a whole different place. Yeah, that's the heart open place. You can navigate, you can be flexible, you can pace yourself. 
You can know what is practical for today doesn't have to be identical to what was practical a week ago because everything is changing all the time. Yeah. So all of these practices are internal first, and then there's the behaviors that flow from them. Yeah. Instead of I'm going to go out and do, 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 do. That's not the practice. The practice is why, how, what. Get it organized, get it clean, clear, and then do less than you think you can, because then you'll do it again. There's a, sometimes you'll go to, I don't know, a fundraising dinner and they'll say something like, give until it hurts. Have you ever heard this, right? Give until it hurts. A Buddhist would say, don't, <laughs> right? If you feel like, oh, I could give a hundred dollars. I could, it would make for a rough rest of my month and I might not get all the groceries I need, but I could give a hundred dollars. Okay. That's not what we would say to do. We would say, if you can give a hundred, give 50. Yeah, because then you will give a happy 50 and another 50 another time and another 50 another time because you will be happy the whole time. It's a very important psychological tool. You won't trigger deprivation mentality that says, I'll do it just this once. Yeah, instead you'll say, actually, this is part of my life and what I want to develop. And then it has a beautiful momentum and a continuity and without resentment without guilt, without shame, it's a happy 50 rather than a grudging 100. Yeah. So your best friend wants to talk to you and you know that they're gonna talk about the same drama as yesterday. It's just gonna be variations on a theme. You can set a time limit and say, okay, I'm here. I'm 100% here. I am here for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And then we're gonna call it a day. Yeah. And you know that that will make it more possible for you to be there for them long term and it won't be like at the end of the year you've had enough and you're like do you know what i'm not taking any of your calls ever because all you do is whine yeah you get fed up if you overdo your capacity so the development of these practices is very much like what you do for your body when you're exercising you know, would you ever say I exercised once and it didn't work, so I'm never going to do it again? I mean, I say that all the time, but we know it's not rational. Yes, <laughs> right? I exercised that one time and I didn't like it, so I'm not going to. But, you know, with generosity, it's a similar thing of it's a practice, which means you have to do it more than once, which means it should stretch you a little, but it should not hurt. If it hurts, you've gone too far and there'll be a backlash. Yeah, so you're like building your strength gently, gently. Yeah, any, any other thoughts about generosity? Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Tenzin. So generosity, I think we get it. Yeah, the, the matter is like how to practice it and that's personal and that's specific to you and keep coming back to it's the intention. Yeah, not the behavior, it's the intention. And the intention you could lie to yourself about, but what's the point? You know, you could say, oh, I'm doing it for this reason. I'm doing it for that reason. But like, you kind of know better if you're telling yourself fibs. So if you're developing this, do you know what? I really want to work on the generosity of offering freedom from fear. That means my project is how do I help people feel safe with me? How do I help them not be criticized or feel criticized when they're around me, even when I'm critical? Yeah, how do I help them feel held and loved and accepted even while I say, I see you doing this and it's not healthy? Yeah, and that's your internal project. And then it might be that you actually want to just chew someone out, not from a good place, and you're telling yourself, oh, this is my offering freedom from fear. I'm doing it out of kindness. Part of you knows that is nonsense, yeah? Yeah, you can only lie to yourself for so long before you get glassy-eyed fanatic look, yeah? And start to crack, you know. So um, start internally, and then gradually the behaviors externally follow. Then we've got um, just to kind of remind us, generosity is the intention to give, right? So now we're on to ethics, which is restraint from harming from a Buddhist perspective. So to be moral, to be good, to be ethical is not some sort of performative behavior. It's about not hurting each other. And then, you know, elaboration on that. But that's the point, right? Restraint from harm. And, you know, patience, forbearance with suffering, joyous effort, 
enthusiasm for beneficial actions, concentration, abiding with the beneficial object, wisdom, realization of ultimate reality. These are all, you know, kind of quickly you can get your head around the gist of it. And then the details really have to be very personal. Yeah. So to make these good things a perfection or a paramita, they must be going beyond the end or reaching towards perfection, meaning Buddhahood. So you're not doing them to be a good person. You're doing them in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, which in the meantime will make you a very nice person. But you're not, your first goal isn't like, let me just be a sweetie. Yeah, and be like nice and fix and help. It's a lot deeper than that, which might mean that you're slightly less helpful in the immediate little fiddly things of a day and more cosmically helpful because you know the importance of bringing peace of mind and stability into whatever situation you're in. You know, so like you might enter into a situation where you see, I don't know, say you're helping in the gompa, right? Say, so there's chairs missing, there's chairs missing. Now it might be someone's job to look after chairs, but because you wanna be a good girl or a good boy, you run around fixing everything and adding things and rushing around. And then you sit down to class and it takes you 20 minutes to settle down before you can even listen. Yeah, or you're going out to friends with a cafe, you know, at a cafe and you're like bringing more chairs to the table, rushing around, rushing around. That's wonderful, good, lovely. And it might be deeper to bring calm to a chaotic space and to notice maybe somebody's already got that covered. Yeah, and if someone's already got that covered, do they want help or not? And checking. Yeah, so in a way, it's kind of breaking this illusion of urgency that attachment has when we bring attachment to wanting to be of benefit. Attachment makes you kind of speedy and a little bit kind of neurotic about the help. And by nature, that makes it kind of short term. You know, so you are helpful, but you're helpful in a very surface, immediate way when you might have the mental strength and power to be helpful in a deeper way if you gave it a couple breaths, you know, if you just like, let's just read the room for a second and just see, maybe some things are under control. Maybe I can add, but let's ask first. And maybe the best thing I can offer is just a calm space. Yeah, or a very slow sentence <laughs> suggestion rather than speedy, speedy, fixy, fixy. Do you know what I mean? So to have this far reaching attitude that is aiming for enlightenment can actually relax you. So that's where it's counterintuitive because if you're at all a perfectionist, then seeking perfection is a terrible idea, yes? And most of us are somewhat perfectionists or somewhat control freaks in some area of our life. So thinking, oh, I have to be perfect, I have to be perfect, it's a terrible idea. But what we're saying is Buddhahood perfection, meaning your own potential fully developed. So what you already have, your kindness and your compassion and your empathy, you already have those things. It's developing into their utmost extent. And then things like anger and anxiety and fear and depression and grumpiness and all of those things that are heavy, those are not you, those are removable. So Buddhahood is removing the things that aren't you that are just symptoms of confusion, symptoms of suffering, behaviors you developed that totally made sense given their context, but are outdated at this point. Yeah, those aren't you, they make sense, you're not bad for having them, but there are things that can be gradually removed and then you develop those good things that you already have. That's the Buddhahood we're talking about and it's gonna take a while. So you wanna think of it as, how wonderful it is my mind can be trained, not how bad I am for not already being there. We feel like the distinction, right? So you're aiming for this perfection with this joyful attitude of how amazing my mind will be when it's not so stuck in its anxiety. Yeah, I am not my anxiety, anxiety is here. How amazing our mind will be when we're not depressed. Depression is here, but we are not depression. Grumpiness, anger, criticism, you know, whatever your go-to mental disturbance is, totally makes sense, totally removable. 
Yeah. And so anything that feels like a trap or a pressure or is preventing you from kindness, do not identify with it. Then you can remove it. If you say to yourself, this is just who I am, then even if you hate it, it hurts to get it off or to remove it. Yeah. If you think this is just who I am, I'm just a neurotic, crazy, anxious person. This is just who I am. Then even if you want to get better at it or move through it or change it in some way, it feels like it costs you a portion of your identity. Who would I be without this darkness? Who would I be without this speed? Yeah. So it's so important to kind of notice that these are behaviors that make sense. They are not portions of myself. Do you feel the difference? So in aiming for perfection, these are the sort of thoughts we want to have. Yeah, it's an aspiration. It's a goal that should make us happy. And it's not going to take um, forever, but almost. <laughs> yeah. So pace it out. Like treat the spiritual path like a marathon that you can enjoy the scenery and you have to pace yourself or you're just crumple on the side of the road and be like, ow. Yeah. You have to pace yourself and enjoy the ride. Otherwise you'll give up and say too hard, not. So that is our reason for doing these things like generosity, etc. right? The reason is to become a Buddha. Yeah. So we looked at generosity and there was those four categories. Now we're looking at ethics. <clears throat> so the technical bit, ethical discipline is an attitude of abs abstention or abstaining that turns your mind away from harming others and from the sources of such harm. Therefore, you bring about the perfection of ethical discipline by progressively increasing your habituation to this attitude until you reach completion. So that word habituation is key, right? It's a habit. So although ethical discipline does indeed have three divisions, it is explained in this context as the attitude of abstention in terms of the ethical discipline of restraint, the principal division. So this is like technical scholar speech. And normally I would not subject you to it, but I think it's important to kind of like not get intimidated by words that are this dense because they'll keep coming up. And if you're scared of them, you'll miss the magic within them. So I'm only gonna do tiny little tastes of the dense scholarly translations, but just to kind of like help us not be so intimidated. We totally get what this means if we just sit with it for a second, even though it's not normal way of talking. <laughs> yes. So we're talking habituation, we're talking restraint from harm. And then in terms that include motivation, the 10 abstentions that eliminate the 10 non-virtues, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle gossip, covetousness, ill will, and wrong views. So this is your classic list of 10. These are the things that hurt yourself and hurt others. So to have ethics means to refrain from those. Yeah. And you can just break them into, we hurt each other with our bodies. We hurt each other with our speech. We hurt each other with our minds. And of course, mind is primary, but in terms of like the actual conditions that land and hit people and are the condition to really feel the ouch, usually it's the body and the speech. Yeah. So we'll just look at these first three for a sec. So killing is obvious, right? Taking life. Stealing from a Buddhist perspective is taking what hasn't been freely offered that belongs to someone else, right? Like you could take a pine cone, but make sure it's a loose pine cone, not a property pine cone, you know, like not a potpourri display at a candle shop or something, don't steal their pine cones, right? But like, so it hasn't been freely offered. So this is where we think, oh, I would never steal. I'm not a stealer until you think about your internet use. Yeah, and the things that we might download that maybe have not been freely offered and maybe someone made them, in hopes of having some sort of income to support their livelihood. And we're just taking without having asked, without them having offered, you know, just thinking it's a victimless crime. It's not good for your heart to think in those terms, to have entitlement in those terms, to think just because I don't see immediate harm to them, it's fine. Because somebody made it, someone owned it, there is harm, even if it's indirect. But more than that, what pattern does it create in your mind to feel entitled? What does it do to you to think 
yes, but I'm a special case. Or yes, because I'm doing it for a good reason, it's fine. Like, what does it do to your heart? And what does it do to your relationships? So like taking a pen from work is not the end of the world, is it? Even if it's a pen from work that nobody offered and is actually belonging to that desk and it has a chain attached and everything and you're like, yoink, it's mine. You know, like no one is really being hurt by that necessarily. But your attitude about that has a ripple effect. And that's the more important thing always is what is the karmic ripple effect of that? What is the behavioral ripple effect of that? To think I deserve it, it's fine for me. I'm a special case. I can get away with it. No one's watching. Like, what does that do? And then kind of how does that play out in your relationships? I'm entitled to a little bit more time, a little bit more air time while talking, a little bit more space, a little bit more this, a little bit more that. And it has an effect, doesn't it? And then sexual misconduct from a Buddhist perspective is just taking someone's recognized partner or cheating on your own. Um, Unless you're in a, you know, sort of what consensual polyamorous situation and everybody's on board and you've talked it through and there's no deception. Okay. So, you know, like consensual polyamory with adults and no one's being hurt. That's fine. But don't take someone's recognized partner. Yeah. The thing is about deception and betrayal. I think that's probably obvious why. Yeah. I had a uh, question about stealing. Uh, when... Um... I do a lot of painting uh, and I, I have, um, I go to the websites and even when I'm not creating, I'm just uh, watching some painting or some other people's painting. And sometimes I feel, oh, uh, this looks like um, another one, uh, like the art of another mm. artist. Yeah. But I don't know them and I don't tell them that I have it's not kind of a stealing but it's like derivative the uh, copying or not really but taking ideas mm -hmm. is it like it's been a long time I I ask myself is it a good thing or I should I tell them or yeah, it's a, it's a good question I mean more important is ask yourself like what what are you getting up to like if you're inspired by someone else's work, say you're inspired by someone else's work, just say it, don't be sneaky, you know, don't be creepy about it and make out that it's your original idea, your original design, say I was inspired by Picasso, that's why I'm doing cubes, you know, just name it, right, so, you know, art and music and these kind of things are there's no real 100% original idea anywhere right everything is derivative, and yet there is still intellectual property. And I think the more important thing is to ask yourself, am I taking what's not freely offered? In terms of what they're getting up to, it's kind of like, mind your own business, right? Unless they're obviously stealing or obviously doing harm or obviously making out that they have originated an idea that very obviously someone else came to first, unless it's a real obvious case, I would stay out of it, yeah? Um, it's more important to be clean, clear about our own inspiration, you know? And also in terms of what we offer to the world, you know, we can think I made this all by myself, whatever it is, but there's no such thing, right? There's no such thing as something you made all by yourself. Yes, everything was learned or inspired or supported or was a coming together of, and yet you can think how wonderful it is that it happened and I was a part of it. And that's gonna make you a lot more relaxed if people start to take your ideas. You know, having excessive ownership as a Dharma practitioner, not super useful, but acknowledging that other people have that, also very useful. So it feels like a paradox, like you're trying to work on not feeling ownership while at the same time honoring other people's view of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it feels kind of weird, but like we're trying to like, create a whole different atmosphere around ourselves that is very careful and honoring and acknowledging and citing sources, but use my stuff. I don't care. I don't own anything anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank I, you. Yeah, but yeah, when in doubt, just check copyright laws, fair yeah. use, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, be practical. Plenty of stuff out there that's freely offered. 
yeah, other other thoughts about those three, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct? Yeah, go ahead. I was just curious regarding that. What about violence or sexual violence? Would that fall under sexual misconduct as well? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and it's, it's a question that I, I've asked my teachers a lot, like why adultery, you know, uh, on sexual, <laughs> like of all the things you're like, that's not ideal, but it's not like the worst thing, <laughs> right? And there's a few different schools of thought about whether um, sexual violence is sexual misconduct or if it's just misconduct and it happens to be via a sexual format. Mm. Because, you know, we know like, you know, rape is usually about power mm. plus some sex, right? Yeah. Plus misogyny, yeah. plus et cetera, plus, plus all the things. So a hundred percent, it is never okay. First of all, hundred percent, it's never okay. Child abuse, sexual assault, never okay. Um, no context for the okayness of that in Buddhism, not to fear. Whether or not it goes under sexual misconduct is really whether you're asking yourself, is it anything that has to do with sexual organs? Sure. So there's those two schools of thought, basically. If you're putting everything that has any sexual element in that category, certainly it can go there. But if you're talking more in terms of behaviors the normal society should try and refrain from, then it's like it doesn't go on the list because it's so extreme and so bad. It's like it goes without saying. So just misconduct in general. Yeah, or exactly. Body in a way. It's you know probably driven by afflictions like anger and attachment, and so huge, heavy negative karma. Um, in the sexual misconduct section of the Lamrim Chenmo like all ancient religions, there's like a giant list of things you're not supposed to do, right? Some of which you're like, really, why not? You know, like no sex during the day. No, no less than five times per night. Like it's very specific. Yeah, and you're like, really? Okay, well, fair enough. Like don't take someone else's sex worker. Use only your own. It's on the <laughs> list. I'm not even kidding, right? And you're like, all right, I'm challenging the whole premise. Anyway, we'll just leave that. That's fine. Sex workers, it's fine, whatever. Like to each their own, let's not be exploitative. It, what? What is some kappa, right? <laughs> You're sort of like, what is going on? And those were not actually from the Buddha. Those were add-ons around the third century that was in a bit of response to the popularity of the Karma Sutra from Vedic traditions, right? Like, so there was a little bit of a response of there's an appropriate use of sexual energy that might facilitate forms of concentration. And then there's people just getting lost in the fun of it and like neglecting the rest of their life and getting a bit carried away. Yes, <laughs> and that could happen, right? Like young people reading the Karma Sutra might get distracted and like lose track of the rest of their responsibilities because they're having too much fun. So let's cap it at five times per night, kids. Like, <laughs> right? And you're like, all right. <laughs> right? So it's so specific, but the Buddha was not that specific. The Buddha was like, don't hurt each other. Betrayal is bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you're reading any of those ancient texts, there's all sorts of specifics that are like, hmm, I would like more context, please. <laughs> Why not? But it's always about either community harmony or um, hygiene or things around harm, you know, ripple effect harm. So even some of the things we would say are quite outdated now because there are cleaner ways to do things or there are consensual ways to do things. And so you read the list and you think, oh, that's a bit closed-minded, but actually for the context of the time, it made sense. Yeah, yeah. So nowadays, most Geshis just say, don't cheat on your partner, don't take someone else's. Yep, and by all means, consent. <laughs> yeah, always consent. Enthusiastic consent, right? Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Yeah, other, other thoughts from those three, you guys? So would you speak some to the type of, I, this might be off topic, so if it's too far, feel free to ignore it. Um, the anecdotes, especially, and some of these things I do in small ways, and some I just notice mind for, like thoughts that come up around them, because these are some of like killing maybe in some of my food choices, but you know, I, I've not killed a person. So, but I can see, I'd still have thoughts that are violent towards people in some way, you know, in subtle ways. And so it's relevant. And are the anecdotes in this realm of like harm towards the body? Is, is there a collection of them for that? Or are they all really different for these three? And does it get, I know it gets quite granular. So whatever level you want to speak to it. 
Yeah, I mean, in this context of the 10 non-virtues, these are things that Buddhists believe are negative karma for anyone who do, does them, whether they're Buddhist or not, um, these are negative karma, right? It's negative to kill, whether you have a vow not to kill or not, it's negative to kill. You know, it's a natural misdeed. And there is nothing in samsara that doesn't involve some form of killing. So the key point is intention, yeah, and the reasons why. So for example, if you're you know, in the middle of the woods stranded for weeks and the only thing to eat is a fish you catch with a stick, then that is a lot less heavy a karma than I'm gonna kill fish for fun and not even eat them. Yeah, it could be the same amount of fish, could be the same killing process, but the reason makes a difference. Yeah. Um, direct killing is something that we actually don't do very much of and that's the prohibition. So, Killing the fish yourself is a heavier karma than buying a fish from the supermarket, which sounds weird, right? Because didn't they do that on your behalf? Isn't that, you know, all those kind of things occur to you. The reason is that they did not kill it for you specifically. Yeah, if they killed it for you specifically, for you it's the same karma as having killed it yourself. But if they're killing anyway, and you wind up reaping the quote benefit, it's one removed. So it's not like it's perfect and it's not like it's 100% fine, but it's a lot less heavy than direct killing. What the animal is makes a difference. Your reason makes a difference. Um, they say like if you still eat meat because you need to because of your health or because of your psyche, it's better to eat a larger animal because it feeds more people. You know, so rather than having a bowl of shrimp, which is like, you know, 20 lives, you have a piece of steak and that cow is now fed whatever 20 people. Of course, you know, find something that's organic, grass fed, you know, mindfully herded, blah, blah, all the things. Yeah. <laughs> right. But um, what we're trying to do really is consider all forms of consumption and minimize them, because in minimizing consumption, we minimize lots of forms of harm. While not getting too uptight and not thinking that if we're a magic fallen fruit, vegan, Jane ascetic that we're somehow perfect and good because we still have to walk from point A to point B and we're gonna kill some ants accidentally. Yeah, but killing those ants accidentally, walking from point A to point B is a lot different than looking at them, looking for them, stamping on them and being happy about it. Yeah, so intention always matters. But it, was that your question or were you going a different angle? I was, yeah, that I think spoke to the killing part, but I was asking actually about anecdotes in the mind. So you see something come up that's maybe oh, violent right. in some way towards someone, oh. or you have yeah. a sexual thought about, you know, not your partner, right. like an anecdote in that moment like a story to move in your, your head, mind right. in the other direction. Because, yeah. um, I mean, I could think, oh, I know it's bad. And maybe if you're just thinking about the karma is the right thing, is what, can you give some advice about what, yeah, you can have some mind, serial killer you know? fantasies you want to share with the group. No, <laughs> <laughs> some, <laughs> something. Yeah, I'm teasing. No, um, we all have like random thoughts. Yes, like some of them are random intrusive thoughts that kind of come out of nowhere. Some of them are thoughts that we cultivate. So there's a difference between a thought that just kind of occurs to you, like. I wish this person dead. And then you think, no, I don't. No, I don't. That's a lot less heavy than let us plot and fantasize and think about how it would go and delicious blood and some sort of creepiness. Yes, that's really bad. Don't do that. But if you have a random passing thought of, ah, you know, curse you, and then you address it, it's pretty light karmically. If you think that person's partner is such a cutie, I want to take them, but I'm not gonna a lot less heavy than, you know, planning a whole fantasy and how it's going to go and how the curtains will ripple and all of the, you know, letting it play out is a lot different than having it pass through. Do you feel the difference? So just a thought passing through is very little karma, but kind of catching it as it passes through and then elaborating on it and encouraging it and returning to it is a lot heavier. But the heaviest is actually follow through. Yeah, it's only really really quote bad if you follow through and are like yeah I did that yeah that's when it gets heavy so don't, you know we all have weird thoughts don't give them too much energy don't feel guilt and shame just go I'm going to work on that one that train of thought is not one of my healthiest ones let's just shift the story to a different one
So yeah, don't let it eat you if you've had random serial killer fantasies, just try not to now, okay? <laughs> yeah, right? Or you're having some sort of crazy orgy situation, you're like, yeah, no, let's not, you know, just nip it in the bud, don't give it energy, move on. Don't let it weigh on you. Don't let it make you think you're a bad person, you're not. We've had beginningless lifetimes, we've gotten up to all sorts of nonsense. There's nothing new under the sun. Of course, we're gonna have random stuff occur to us, just let it roll through. My question has to do with the connection between morality and taking vows. Mm -hmm. And so, and specifically I'm asking as a, a non-monastic. Um, I guess my question is twofold. Um, I'm familiar with taking vows such as the precepts. Um, and, you know, to me, that's very ritualized. But let's say there was a, uh, an area of morality that was difficult for me. Um, is it possible to use vows as, as one of my skills? I mean, is that ever done? Or are there other vows I would take just for the, you know, the mindfulness of the morality? So kind of vows is my question. You can take it where you want. Like taking okay. a vow that's not existing on the list, but doing it that as a practice? Uh, any, anything else that I'm doing with great abandon, even though I know better? I, I think that, um, you know, vows make things more powerful, but we don't need to, I guess, go off book, <laughs> you know? Like really the five lay vows and then the bodhisattva vows and the tantric vows, they're gonna cover everything. Um, and lay people can take those. Even just saying to yourself, I'm going to keep the ethics of non-harmfulness and refrain from these 10 non-virtues. Pretty much everything is covered within the 10 non-virtues. They're all variations of a theme. You know, when we get into the speech ones, it's like, yeah, that's basically your whole day there. Just refraining from those. Yes. <laughs> and so whatever like specific habit, it's gonna fall under one of those categories. So you can just think, this is my practice of ethics. And you could pick one behavior that you wanna work on and say, this is my practice of ethics and really zero in on it and make it emphasized. Yeah, and you know, if you wanna to promise to the Buddha, promise to the Buddha, but every day we're doing purification practice if we can, you know, it might be something you're not doing yet, but what you do is you're making a very gentle time specific promise that says until tomorrow, I'm going to refrain from divisive speech or something like that. Or until the next hour, I'm not gonna indulge in thoughts of hatred. And you think, okay, an hour's too long, 15 minutes. For 15 minutes, I'm not going to indulge in thoughts of anger, like say you're really mad at someone, yeah? Those end of the day purification practices, they aren't vows, but they're like promises you make to yourself under the compassionate gaze of the Buddha. Yeah, and they're things that help you have momentum in changing habits. So if you fail, now Zeus is gonna send down lightning and strike you down, you just try again, <laughs> you know? The Buddha has so much love for you, so much compassion for you. They understand why you do everything that you do. They're not judging you. You're just saying it in front of them for a bit of backup, a bit of support, you know, not some like parental godlike figure going, you are bad, you know, that's not how we are. That's not what we're about. Yes, hello. Um, I was thinking about my cats and feeding them canned food. Um, and I, I really cringe and I really waver and also um, protecting them if there are insects in my house, uh, killing those insects to protect my cats from them getting the insects getting in their fur. Yeah. So you kind of address that with intent, but I think my biggest question is around the canned food. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, feeding. it's, I mean, it's much better to have that meat product because you want to look after a sentient being than having that meat product for fun or for attachment or for this or for that. Right. But um, you know, it's not ideal and it's, it's something that we can try and, and purify the ripple effect of, but we can also think there are people that eat meat and then there are waste products of that meat and it going to cats is not the worst thing in the world that, there's a million ways to, to think about it. Um, I think that, 
we have to keep coming back to there is no way to avoid harm if you're in samsara. So you just like triage a little bit and ask, what are the areas where it makes the most sense for me to adjust my habits? And feeding the cat needs to be done because I've taken the responsibility to look after this creature. You know, I've already taken that responsibility. It's already happened to then send the cat onto the street. That would be really breaking a commitment I made with that sentient being. That would be really unkind and irresponsible. So you've made that commitment. Now you just kind of do the best you can with that. And one thing you can do with any meat product is try to benefit the sentient being that once inhabited it by reciting medicine Buddha mantras and blowing on the meat. So then the being who was once associated with that meat, who's now, you know, in the bardo or in their next life, you're kind of sending them on their way with more positive imprints. So there's nice things you can do even for the being whose meat it was. Yeah, medicine Buddha mantra is a really good way. Yeah, yeah. So it's like there's no easy solutions in samsara. So therefore we want to get out of samsara. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right. So we'll have a little five minute break and then we'll do the meditation. So if you guys want to stretch your legs and we'll come back at about eight. Okay, we'll do um, just a brief meditation on ethics and I'll weave in those others of the 10 non virtues so that we can unpack them. But this is um, Basically, it's, it's just a self-reflection to ask yourself, where are your habitual stuck spots? In no way should you think, here are all the ways that I'm bad. It's more like, oh, right, my tendency is dot, dot, dot. Knowing that is fantastic. You know, it's almost like if you've ever had like an amorphous illness of some kind or like an abstract pain somewhere and you didn't know what it was and it kind of worried you. And, you know, every time I stand up, my hip does a weird click or something. And then someone told you what it was. You're like, oh, that's what it was. I'm so glad I know. Now I have something I can do about it. But before it was known, it was just this kind of like ominous, heavy, like, what is this? Yeah. And we want to think about our examine of ethics similarly, like, oh, I cause pain to myself and others because of that. Oh, I'm glad I figured that out. That's the thing. That's the thing I'm going to work on then. Right? Just like if you figured out you had a, a disease or a pulled muscle or had been eating the wrong thing, you're like, oh, well, I want to eat potatoes. Obviously, the potatoes were the problem you know, or whatever it is. You know, you found it. Now you can work on it. So try and hear all of this as an invitation to go, oh, okay, okay, yep, not identify with it, okay? So just take a minute and get yourself in a meditation posture. So basically straight back and straight without rigidness. And just be in your body for a moment. Bring your mental awareness to your physical experience. Notice if the body is tense. Notice where it's relaxed. And just see if you can invite some relaxation to any areas of tension. and shift your focus to the breath. And so we'll focus on the breath for just two minutes, allowing the surface distractions to settle before shifting to analysis. 
So see if you can just watch the breath without push or pull with your thoughts. As thoughts arise, neither agree with them nor disagree with them. Just allow them to roll through naturally, keeping your primary interest on the breath. And come back to your intention that this meditation, may it develop our mind into its fullest potential in order to be of benefit to all sentient beings. And for that reason, we're going to shift to analysis and just consider our habits around physical harm. And just take a moment very gently, without criticism or judgment, to name the behaviors of killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct that seem a little habitual in your own life. Major forms or minor forms, you're just making a list with great gentleness and self-compassion. What do I do? Maybe it helps to think situationally. Maybe you never kill anything ever, except when you're cleaning. Or maybe you never steal anything ever, unless you're desperate for entertainment. Or you would never cheat on anyone ever, unless you decided they were your soulmate. Just kind of look at your patterns of justification or situations where it's most likely for these to occur.
and think to yourself, none of those are my nature. They're just habit patterns or mistakes of the past, removable. And then look at speech. And you ask yourself of the non-virtues of speech, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle gossip, What's the most common in my life for me? What's my go-to misstep verbally? And then look at them individually and think, when is lying something I justify or habitually do? When does deception make most sense to me? Is it when I'm trying to prove something or soothe something, avoid something or shield myself? Is it for escape or entertainment? Why do I lie? And with divisive speech, intending intentionally to divide others, either through truth or through lies, saying something bad about someone else in hopes that the other person will think badly of them or better of me. When has this happened in my life? How common is it now? And then harsh speech, which could also be true or untrue. But when do I intend to wound with my words? How often does that happen? What does it look like for me personally? Harsh speech.
and then shift to looking at our habits of idle gossip. So lacking a positive or a neutral intention when we just talk out of attachment or anger. Maybe gossiping about politics or celebrities or things just to fill in space. And it's not really about the topic because it could be a frivolous topic, but the intention is to connect with others. So it's fine. But when do we just need to fill in the space with words? And again, think to yourself, these are mistakes or behaviors or habits that make complete sense given my life so far, given the conditions around me. They're problematic, I want to change them, but they aren't me. And for the most part, they are symptoms of suffering. But if I was in a happy peace of mind, if I felt healthy and supported, I probably wouldn't do any of these. So it makes no sense to be mad at myself for doing them. Just like it would make no sense to be mad at myself for sneezing if I had a cold. It's just a symptom. And all of them are driven by one or all of these afflictions, covetousness related to attachment, ill will related to hatred, wrong views related to ignorance just variations on these themes. And so if you were to ask yourself in a moment of stress, does your stress usually look like attachment, neediness, craving, panic, anxiety, that genre? Or does it look more like irritability, grumpiness, anger, hard heart, frustrated, that genre, or is it confused or spacey, vague, superstitious, that genre? Which of those three seem to be your go-to when you're stressed? And it's just an exercise of self-knowing. And whichever one it is, 
or if they seem to take turns quite equally, it doesn't really matter. It's just about knowing that. So it's easier to catch that when they're small enough to change. Any of these three in its fully fledged form is very hard to shift out of. But all three of them, when they're in their infancy, are easy to catch. So what's the smallest version that if you noticed it arising, you could head it off? Your tiniest version of attachment, hatred, or ignorance. What does it look like for you? Small enough to catch before it gets out of hand. And again, think even those states of mind are not me, they're just habits, behaviors I can change, mentalities I can grow out of. My mind is trainable, not tainted by these, just habituated to them. And so now connect with your positive states of mind, compassion, wisdom, knowing you have them both, knowing they can both be developed. And compassion and wisdom can be elaborated into those six perfections. We can have the behaviors of attempting to be a bodhisattva with these six perfections. And so dedicate all of the energy you put into this session to developing those to their utmost extent for the benefit of all sentient beings. And all of that energy represented by Om Mani Peme Hum, we dedicate with the mantra. Om Mani Peme Hum. Om Mani Padme 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 Hum. Okay, so those 10 non-virtues are something useful to have a look at. If the list is new to you and you're not used to looking at it, you could just think in terms of body, speech, mind. Yeah, what do I get up to? What needs a little bit of tweaking? Again, with just enough objectivity and space to say it's here, but not me. It's my responsibility, not my fault. You know, holding those kind of ideas 
then you can start to sh shift patterns without increasing your self-loathing and all of the various things that we do to hurt ourselves. It actually can feel like you're freeing yourself up. Um, do you have any questions? We have a couple minutes before we need to stop. Um, any last minute thoughts or, I don't know, stuck spots or anything like that? Go ahead. Um, I thought what you said in the meditation about idle speech was really interesting around if your intention is to connect, it's maybe okay if the topic isn't all that profound. Because that's the one I struggle with a lot, actually, is idle speech, like understanding what is idle and what is positive. Yeah. Yeah, it very much is about why. Yeah. Um, you know, there's people in your life who are not going to have a Dharma conversation. And to force that on them is just going to make conflict in the relationship. But you could talk about football. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Um, you could talk about the weather, you could talk about music, you could talk about something seemingly worldly and frivolous, but the point is connection. So he, who cares about the content, particularly if it's like harmless content, isn't it? So talking about the weather could be senseless speech if you're feeling neurotic and you need to fill in the space, or it could be a great kindness because the only thing your grandmother feels safe talking to you about is the weather. <laughs> You know, so the topic isn't ever really the issue, unless it's an obviously harmful topic, you know, something really divisive. But, you know, I was thinking about how sometimes we talk about politics as if it's virtuous to do so in and of itself, when in fact it could just be another form of divisive speech. Mm -hmm. Like if we're talking about it, is it really a neutral thing if we're talking to friends who agree, or is it a way to increase our divisive energy? You know, or is it just something we do to fill in space and sound smart? You know, like the reason is very important. Yeah, so senseless speech is a tricky one because we might be really good about the rest of our speech, but idle speech comes so naturally. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Tenzin. Hi. Um, I was just going to ask uh, if you could recommend, because you mentioned earlier about um, daily uh, purification prayers. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering if there's like a good, uh, well, if there is a uh, good purification type uh, prayer that you would recommend. Purification. Tibetan or English, just to set the intentions for the day. Because mm. um, what happens is usually uh, when I wake up, sometimes I'm in a bad mood. Um, and, you know, that kind of dictates, sort of dictates the flow of the day almost. Yeah. Uh, but other times when I wake up and, you know, I wake up with feeling gratitude and things of that nature, um, usually the day kind of progresses pretty uh, well. Yeah. And, um, I, and uh, you know, I, I meditate daily and I try to alternate between um, single pointed and, and um, um, I'm also trying out um, this meditation that I read in one of Lama Rishi's uh, books where you visualize uh, a British Shakyamuni. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of <laughs> kind of hard thing to alternate between uh, single pointed, single pointed, and then doing the Buddha Shakyamuni, and then I also sometimes do the Om Ahum meditation that Lama students uh, taught. Uh, but I was yeah. wondering, um, like you know, just like a basic, I guess, a purifying intention or prayer of such things. Do you know good old Omani Pemehum is never going to go out of style, right? Like Omani Pemehum is like your go-to for everything. It can be your setting intention. It can be your purifying. It can be your protecting your mind from your own <laughs> thoughts. It can be um, trying to change the atmosphere of a space. Like Omani Pemehum is incredible, powerful mantra. So sometimes in the morning, um, I do the refuge bodhicitta prayer when I first wake up before I'm even opening my eyes, like I can feel that I'm waking up and I do refuge bodhicitta. But if it's like one of those grumpy days, like you're describing, you're like, I am in a mood and I do not want to get up and grr, then I'm just oh, money, pay me home, oh, money, pay me home until I kick myself out of that headspace because that mantra can lift you. Yeah. So just om mani pemme om mani pemme om. You don't have to sing it all pretty. You don't have to chant it. Just om mani pemme om until it kicks in, right? And it'll kick in. Give it a minute. Yeah. 
But um, The Tantric Path of Purification is a really excellent book on purification and the Vajrasattva practice at the end of the day, super helpful. It's like having a karma shower or like a karma detox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Vajrasattva practice is super, super helpful at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, it's a little overwhelming, but it gets to be a habit very easily. And there's tons of videos on YouTube to help walk you along. Um, you can Google quick Vajrasattva practice Yunten and you can have me rabbiting on at you, but also a million other people probably too. Um, it's 15 minutes. It's really short. Yeah, but really the essence of practice, whether you're a big meditator or not, is to bookend your day. Yeah, so in the morning, just keep telling yourself your own motivation until you believe it again. Yeah, you believe it, right? But like it doesn't have oomph right? Especially if you're having a, a hazy morning or a grumpy morning or just I'm not feeling it. Like you still want to work for the welfare of all sentient beings, but you sort of also really want coffee and they're of equal value, right? Like it takes a while for the bodhicitta really to be true. You just keep telling yourself about it until it's true again. You can be walking around, you can be filling your kettle, you can brush in your teeth. Like the Dharma has to infuse your life for it to really have impact. Then when you do your sitting practice, you're already in the flow of it. It doesn't take so long to settle down because you've been telling yourself about your practice while you're just doing normal stuff, you know? Put the coffee in the plunger. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness and the conditions for happiness like this coffee, you know? <laughs> However you want to phrase it, but like make it real. And then at the end of the day, it's just a check-in of where did I fall off my path? Where did I stay on it? So you do your regretting and your rejoicing. And both of those words are kind of like whatever religious -y words, but it's just a reflection and you don't have to sit all proper and do all fancy. Just did I stay in alignment with my path or not? Where did I fall? What were the conditions around that? Where did I stay on? Like be happy about that. You know, it's no good to just do purification, also do rejoicing. Like there's a million kind things we do in a day and we just, kind of let it go like it's nothing like of course of course I was polite to so and so who was hard work and of course of course I let help this old lady at the grocery store of course you know everyone would but like value it you know like take a minute and go that was good I'm glad I did that you know it's it can be cringy for us but like make yourself if you're going to do any kind of purification also do rejoicing so then all, that vibe blur, blows into your daily practice in such a way that you have the mental space to say, okay, now that I'm on my cushion, first thing, shamatha, 20 minutes, second thing, Shakyamuni Buddha, 20 minutes, that's it for the day. Quit while you're ahead, quit while you're still happy, yes? And then if you're feeling, oh, I wanna do more, I wanna do more, then tell yourself, tomorrow, I'll do a different one. It's really important to quit while you're ahead so you keep the energy. Yeah, because you might have lots of momentum one day and then forever after be disappointed that you didn't work that hard. <laughs> you know, I was like, that was just that day. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember I asked my teacher once, shall I do this big, long, fancy retreat? And he said, for you, I think better do this small thing every single day forever. <laughs> and I was like, but I want to do a big, fancy retreat. And he's like, maybe, but right now do this little tiny thing every day forever. <laughs> you know? And then slowly it builds, slowly it builds. Yeah. And that's the way to change habits. Could I ask one more question, please? Um, yeah, sure. But if you guys need to go, please go, because we're now over. So, yeah, please ask. But if you guys need to go, I won't be offended. I was uh, wondering, um, as, as practitioners of Mahayana, because uh, you mentioned uh, 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 Vajrasattva purification prayers, is it okay for me to, like, try to do that? Or is that going to be, like, too advanced? Because I... Of course, definitely consider myself uh, a baby Buddhist, like Lama and she used to say, baby Buddhist. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if, you know, um, if I just stick to Mahayana awesome. and just do everything Mahayana or go to Vajrayana. Just do everything also. Mahayana. If you like Mahayana, do Mahayana. Yeah, just do. Just go for it. And then if you want to do baby Vajrayana, like work in some compassion Buddha, work in some Vajrayana, just make sure you're not doing things you're not empowered to do. But if you're visualizing the deity at your crown and doing the simple version, I say, if you have affinity, full speed ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. just go for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Charity? So I have a question about um, taking refuge in Buddhism. 
because there is a certain mental hang up I have because I come from such a, a fundamental religious background. Right. So as much as I understand intelligently that I am taking refuge in something um, that I may have some problems with uh, emotionally because it feels like conversion or it has some feelings or similarities to things that were actually harmful for me. Um, you know, the more and more I study Buddhism specifically landed following you <laughs> accidentally, however that works in the world. But um, so much of what you say makes a lot of sense to me and co you know, coincides with my own personal journey of, of developing my mind and my, uh, not letting my emotions overcome me. But how would you suggest someone yeah. you know, taking refuge in Buddhism and understanding that without it being some type of conversion experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, give it time for one thing, right? There's like, you can come to Dharma centers and Buddhist centers and 100% participate even in retreats and not be Buddhist. Yeah, like we are not missionaries. We are not prophetizing. Take what is useful, leave what is not. It's none of our business. It's your life. It's your path. So if it feels like medicine, take it. If it feels like it's not medicine, wait or avoid, you know? And the real refuge is your mental training. Like what protects you from suffering is the Dharma that you've integrated. So if you're taking refuge, you're taking refuge in the Dharma essentially and the Buddha and the Sangha peripherally. Yeah, and what Dharma is it? It's the medicine that makes you heal yourself. It's the tools for self-transformation. The Buddha is just the doctor. The Sangha is just the nurses. The Dharma is the medicine. So maybe that helps not feel so, I don't know, fundamentalist or feel so kind of trapped or pressurized. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thanks, everybody. And I'll um, see you same time next week. And um, uh, let's see, ego attachment and liberation coming up soon. A few announcements in the chat. Um, Venerable Amy is teaching this weekend. She's amazing. Everybody go see her. <laughs> Good night, folks. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much.